Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, thank the uh, Green Mountain Academy for bringing me back, even after I assured my audience that Donald Trump would not win the presidency in <laughs> 2016. They keep bringing me back. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I'd like to thank the Long Trail School for putting uh, me up here and uh, technical help there. I'd like to take a moment to thank Long Trail Ale, one of my favorite beers. I don't know if it has anything to do with the school, but it's gotten me through a lot. And thank all of you for coming out on uh, what was the crappy weather when I left Middlebury. It seems to have um, brightened up as I've gotten down here. So for those of you who have not come to these before, um, uh, let me be clear, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. And I will try to do so in a somewhat comprehensive manner, but also a pretty clear manner. But sometimes I forget what it looks like on your side. I've seen all these slides a thousand times. And you may be um, seeing them uh, for the first time, and they're not making nearly as much sense. So stop me. Raise your hand. So I've titled this talk, How I Spent My Summer Vacation, because um, every four years I begin um, my summer vacation by attending candidate rallies. My wife, Allison, and I, have, um, we tag team together. She's a local politician, but she's able to get time off. And we go to candidate rallies. And I take notes. I talk to people who are at the rallies. I listen to the way the candidates are presenting themselves. Uh, and then I write it up on my Presidential Power blog. And I started this when uh, I gave a talk, a version of it I think I gave uh, at Green Mountain Academy, explaining why Donald Trump probably wouldn't be president. Um, and very early on, when he had announced he was running in 2015, you remember he came down the escalator um, and um, made this long, rambling speech in which, among other things, he claimed that Mexicans were not sending their best people um, across the border here, and made a number of statements which led me to believe he would be out of the race in a New York minute. Um, and yet, uh, he was not, even though he later um, attacked John McCain, said, I like uh, my heroes that aren't captured, and so on and so forth. He seemed to break every rule in the book. And it struck me that I really had no idea why this guy was staying in the race. And not only was he staying in the race, he was beginning to gain support. Um, and so I started going to Trump rallies and talking to the people who were supporting him. And it reminded me of the importance um, of actually listening to people as opposed to sort of imposing our perspective on them and trying to understand what they've done. So I've tried to do that, and I'm in the middle of doing that now. So part of what I'm going to send to you to show you today is some of my experiences on the campaign trail. But I also want to situate that in the larger understanding of um, what we think we know about political science, sorry, about nomination patterns. So I'm going to present a very brief overview of the state of the race today. I'll talk about those observations from the campaign trail. I'll then introduce you to a little bit of political science theory about how nominations normally work. And then, if we have time, and I don't think we will, um, I might talk a little bit about the general election. But I want to make sure we have time for questions here. So I may skip that fourth point. Um, but certainly, we can address the general election in the context of um, the Q&A, if necessary. Now, a couple of important points here. Normally, when I give a talk here, um, it's about the general election. I'm either predicting the general election or explaining the general election. General elections are very easy to understand. There's usually two candidates. We know what motivates people when they vote. The primary thing is the partisan affiliation of the candidates. The nominating process is a lot more complex. There's a lot more uncertainty playing out. I would be lying to you if I told you I know with um, a certain level of confidence who the Democratic nominee is going to be. So if you're here, Trying to find that out, I'm not going to help. Um, I have some thoughts, more like conventional wisdom thoughts. There's really no science involved. But nonetheless, I'll, I'll try to talk you through that. But you should be clear, this is a little bit different talk than what I've given. It's a kind of a speculative talk. So I hope you're comfortable with speculation, because that's what a lot of this is going to be. All right, quick overview. Where's the state of the race right now? If we look at. Um, Simply polling is one measure of where things are. Each one of these lines is the aggregate polling. So we have many different polls, and we just sort of aggregate them together and come up with a, a where we think at any particular time of the year. This is going from really early in 2015 uh, all the way up through today. This is as of today. 
Um, and these are national polls. So these aren't specific to any particular state. And you can see Joe Biden, once he announced, jumped up. Uh, he's declined somewhat, but he's holding steady more or less at about 30%, 25 to 30%. That's Biden in the green. His two closest um, contenders are in the blue, is our good friend Bernie Sanders. Sanders, after an initial burst, lost support when Biden announced, um, dropped down between 15 and 20, and he's pretty much stayed there, more or less. The person who's come on is Elizabeth Warren. Um, she has gained incremental but steady support, so that right now she is slightly ahead of Bernie Sanders in the aggregate polling and continues to trend upwards. Now, on the way over, I heard some polls were just released suggesting that Warren is moving ahead in states like Iowa. She's certainly um, in New Hampshire. So we should be clear here when we're thinking about winning the nomination, you don't win a national vote, obviously, the way we nominate a candidate. You win a sequence. So we might want to look at the individual states. By the way, a couple of other things to think about here is you'll see periodically these little boomlets. This is Kamala Harris after her first debate performance. It's when she attacked Joe Biden, and she got a temporary boost, and then she dropped off. Um, this is Pete Buttigieg. Um, he got an a initial flurry of attention, and then he sort of incrementally has dropped off a little bit. Um, we also see um, the same thing happening to Beto O'Rourke very early on. You don't quite pick it up here, but Beto O'Rourke was a front runner there for a while. Front runner is too strong a word, but had up to about 10%. He now has dropped off entirely. So one pattern we've seen is for the candidates that do not have name recognition. There is a flurry of attention to them on the campaign trail, what we might call surge. Scrutiny is when we begin to look at their record and then decline. And we saw this happen in 2016 on the Republican side. A lot of second tier candidates got an initial burst of attention. Remember Ben Carson? Ben Carson, now the um, Health and Human Services Secretary. He was uh, housing, sorry, uh, up there. Thank you for correcting me. Uh, burst into uh, the field, was a front runner for a while, then made some missteps, got some scrutiny, and dropped down. So we're seeing that with second tier candidates. But of course, as we said, we don't elect people based on the national polls. We, uh, see them on the basis of sequence of polls. The first in the nation caucus is Iowa. Iowa will have their caucus in early February. I'm going to be out there um, live blogging on caucus day. Um, I hope you follow my blog when I do that. Who's leading in Iowa? Here we see a lot more movement. Now keep in mind Iowa is a caucus. What does that mean? It means it's very difficult to poll because we don't know who's actually going to show up. So take these with a big grain of salt. But you can see for the longest time Joe Biden was in the lead there. He has now begun to lose support, and Elizabeth Warren is moving up. Bernie Sanders is dropping. Pete Buttigieg is moving up. This is Kamala Harris is dropping. So there's a lot of movement. It's very volatile. We're still a long way out before February. A lot of things can happen. Um, generally speaking, Iowa does not determine who the nominee is, but Iowa winnows the field. So if you're not in the top five coming out of Iowa, you're generally done. And you'll see a lot of people drop out after that. We then, of course, move on to New Hampshire, um, the great state, the granite state. Live free or die, baby. And that is where Bernie Sanders, really, he finished a close second to Hillary Clinton in 2016, came off and trounced her in New Hampshire. And that's when suddenly we realized this guy was in it for the long haul, that he was actually a major contender, 2016. He has staked a lot on New Hampshire this time. He's not doing very well in New Hampshire. Um, he just changed his campaign team, as he did in Iowa, um, trying to shake things up. Um, it's not that he's out of the race there, but you can see Sanders here is in the blue, um, and he is right about there. Um, Biden is hanging on ahead of them. Elizabeth Warren, of course, is. Favorite son, favorite daughter from just south is doing very well in the southern part. So those three are splitting up the vote right there with Buttigieg. And right now, um, we'll see how long Harris is hanging around down there in New Hampshire. And then we have a couple of other um, 
early states that are important, Nevada and South Carolina. They're important in a couple of ways. One is regionally. They move us out of predominantly uh, northeast uh, and middle states down south and out west, but also they have a much more diverse demographic. And as we'll see, one of the problems that Bernie Sanders has had in particular is expanding his coalition beyond white voters. Joe Biden right now is doing very well among African Americans. How long that will persist, we don't know, but that is giving him a boost in the polls in Nevada and in South Carolina. Nevada's on the top here. You can see Biden is, we don't have a graph, so you just have to look at these individual polls. There just haven't been enough there, but he has a slight lead, as you can see up there. Um, and generally, um, that lead is very uncertain at this stage because, again, Nevada, very hard to poll. And then South Carolina is on the bottom. Of Biden has a big lead there. Um, South Carolina, again, predominantly African-American, and that's where he is. A lot of his polling support is coming here in the Democratic primary now, when I say predominantly African-American, not in the state as a whole. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about the sequence of things. That's sort of the lay of the land, right? Um, let's talk about what I'm doing. So I'm trying to get a feel for how these candidates present themselves. If you go to a candidate rally, how many have been to a candidate rally? I, encourage you to do that. I know Vermont is not a state that is up for grabs. Bernie is going to win the Democratic nomination. By the way, I'm going to focus on the Democratic nomination here. Predominantly, although we can talk about the Republican nomination. I did try to get to a William Weld campaign rally. He scheduled it for 8 in the morning. It was a bird walk. Um, <laughs> so that says a lot about William Weld's candidacy. So I decided to pass on that. Um, What I like about these, uh, these rallies, come on, is the candidate has about 15 to 20 minutes to make their case. And they're essentially telling you what they want you to believe their candidacy is about. That's what they're doing. And it's really very instructive to be at these rallies to see, A, how each candidate is trying to position themselves, not just in terms of issues, although that's part of it, but also their biography. What do they accentuate? If they go negative, how they go negative, um, and whether they're playing up other aspects of their candidacy, gender, race, and so on. So they're really very insightful. Um, and then the other thing you look at is how people respond. right? And so those are the things I'm looking at. So um, our first rally we went to this year happened to be Joe Biden in New Hampshire at a farmer's market. Um, and a couple of things stood out. Joe, um, turned out I had his last name wrong. I thought it was Biden, but it's not. It's Obama Biden. <laughs> Everything he said in his talk was Obama Biden, Obama Biden, Obama Biden. Right? He is wrapping himself in the mantle of Barack Obama as his vice presidency and saying, I am an extension of that. The second thing he talked almost exclusively about was Donald Trump. The, who could beat Donald Trump? Who has the stature? Who has the name recognition? So he's sort of, and this is very early in the process, and I'm, I'm guessing his stump speech is changing. He was running as if there was no other Democratic candidate out there. He already was the nominee, and the question was, why should you support him uh, over Donald Trump? And he did talk about issues. Climate change was a big one. Um, and he talked a lot about how long he's been working on liberal issues. Um, but he really pulled his punches in terms of things like Medicare for all, and so on. And it's pretty clear, as we'll see later, he's positioning himself as someone who's already looking ahead to the general election, where the electorate is going to be a little more centrist than what you're going to see in the nominating process. Um, by the way, you'll see this particular character. She may be familiar to some of you. Vermont politician, well-known. Anyone recognize her? No, that's my wife. Um, <laughs> She takes notes and all these things, and then I make her get in a picture. Um, there's Joe. I said, Joe, look this way. So he looked the other way, and I took a picture. <laughs> we then, that same particular day, oh, by the way, this is how Biden is framing his candidacy. And I'm going to talk more about this. His name is Obama Biden, of course. Focus on electability. Um, traditional Democrat, he makes the argument that he's best able both to recreate the Obama coalition, that is, attract support from racial minorities. That's where Hillary Clinton fell short. 
She did not bring them out in the same numbers that Obama did. He claims he can, but also in those decisive Rust Belt seat, uh, states. He's the traditional working class Democrat, the old New Deal Democrat, and he's the one who's going to be able to bring those white working class voters that defected from the Democrats and went for Trump. He can bring those back. A couple of the questions. Uh, one thing that was interesting about him, um, he went out in the crowd a little bit. Um, one of the obligatory traditions now that has developed is the candidate selfie. And I put my wife in line so I can get pictures with her with every candidate. You'll see this. Um, Joe Biden, you couldn't get in line unless you had contributed some money. So his selfies were very select selfies. Um, and he, he was a one step removed. He didn't really get into the crowd, um, at least at the that we were at for him. So of course, questions, um, how deep is his support? People I talked to weren't passionate about him, but they respected him. Um, is he too old? And is his form of liberalism passe in the Democratic Party? Has the party moved too far left? We're going to talk about that. And of course, he's the gaffmeister. Um, and we've all known that. Everybody says, oh, he's getting kind of old. He makes verbal gaffes. And I said, he did that when he was young, right? That's not a sign of age. That's a sign of Biden. Um, and of course, he has a record that he has to defend, the Anita Hill and so on. We'll talk about that. OK. We then headed north to the lake country. It was a beautiful day. Um, and it was one of these ubiquitous New Hampshire house parties. Anyone been to a house party? You go to these house parties, usually a local politician opens up their house and invites the candidate to have a more intimate setting. This one was at the lakefront, beautiful place. We went into the candidate's living room, oh, sorry, the host's living room. Um, and this was by far the youngest crowd we saw of any of the rallies. And when I say young, I mean there's young. <laughs> Beto for everyone. Um, we were in the living room, but you can see there are a lot of young people. Beto has actually attracted a lot of support from students. Some of my students got on the Beto bandwagon very early. Uh, he, of course, came out of Texas, established a reputation as a strong candidate, came within five points of Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz was calling me up every night. Um, somehow I got on his phone list, and uh, he would do conference calls, and I would listen in. Um, and he would talk about Beto was being funded by the hard left, not the far left, the hard left. Um, and he needed money from me. Uh, he called me up once a week. So he, Beto sort of made a national reputation, decided to strike while the iron is hot, and run for the president. Um, and um, he's a very charismatic guy, um, so charismatic that he uh, often appears over-caffeinated. Um, he just jumps everywhere. Um, very tall in person, very angular, very personable. But a guy who's sort of working out his agenda, uh, trying to figure out where he stands. Because in Texas, he ran sort of as a moderate. But now he's moved to the left on issues like gun control and on civil rights, two issues that he's playing up on Texas. So he talked a lot about those. The other thing he made a point of saying, the electability issue, he's unlocked Texas. Texas, which has been historically Republican now in presidential elections, he can turn it blue. So he's selling that part of his. Um, and then, of course, we took the selfie right, with that well-known politician. <laughs> He really is tall, and there he is in his Kennedy-esque moment. I thought that was a nice little touch. So a um, couple of questions about him. Is he too young? Is he too inexperienced? He really has no national experience. He was a member of Congress. Is he really a progressive? You talk to other progressives who say he's a Johnny-come-lately to the progressive movement. He's just sort of trying to find an issue space to attract his attention. Um, and he's actually peaked very early in the polls, has now dropped down, and that's why you've seen him become increasingly strident, like using obscenities, anything to attract attention. Um, some of his thunder has been stolen by Pete Buttigieg, who is really taking some of the younger voters away as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, we then went to uh, John Hickenlooper. I almost dropped this slide, because what do we know about John? He's gone. Uh, his candidacy was never very focused. Um, <laughs> let's see, here he is at Dartmouth. There was all of 25 people there. Um, and uh, very impressive guy, I got to tell you. I didn't know that much about him. Heard him speak very impressive. Um, like a lot of the governors, the Bullocks, um, the, the, the Hickenloopers, um, his argument is, I have a record of accomplishment 
in contrast to these legislators, who all talk about what they're going to do, but never accomplish anything, as governor, you've got to do things. And I got bipartisan background uh, support for background checks in Colorado. I got increased spending for infrastructure spending. A um, lot of record of accomplishments. He says, this is the type of guy, when you're looking at president, you should be voting for, Hickenlooper, right? Um, a guy with a record of accomplishment. It went nowhere. Um, his candidacy died very early. In fact, the first question that was asked here by a student was, why aren't you running for Senate in Colorado? Why are you running for president? Because there's a weak Cory Gardner is the, the Republican there, is very vulnerable. And Hickenlooper said, oh, I have no interest in running for Senate. I, I'm committed for the long haul to be president. And then he dropped out and he's running for Senate. But he had to say that. Well, the great thing about this is since there was nobody there, that's his press secretary practically begged me to ask a question. I said, no, I'm just here to record things. He said, well, don't you have any questions? Ask a question. So I actually got a lot of time to talk to Hickenlooper because there was no one else there. And uh, I felt bad for the guy. Um, who else do we have here very quickly? Oh, yeah. Um, partly, I thought Hickenlooper, I kept him in here because he raises an important question. Has the Democratic Party in the nominating process moved too far left? for a guy with his type of views. And that's gonna be a real question because one of the arguments that Hickenlooper made was, listen, you may view me as sort of a centrist and that you may hold your nose and say that's a dirty word, but when you have to run against Trump in the general election, these issues that got you nominated are going nowhere for the voters that count, those more moderate voters in the general election. Um, but it did not gain traction, at least in polls, and of course his money dried up, and when your money dries up, you get to drop out. But I thought it was important that we talk about him because of that. All right, we then saw Julian Castro. That was not my best Julian Castro, there he is. This is at a house party in New Hampshire. This was in J.D. Salinger territory, a former state legislator who has been hosting these things since back in the 1990s. Castro showed up about two hours late, uh, but the crowd hung around with him. I didn't think he was going to make it, so I told this well-known politician, just stand next to his sign, and I'll take a picture there. And then Castro showed up. Um, he is a very impressive individual, um, raised by his grandmother, Mexican immigrant. He and his twin brother, uh, parents divorced when he was very young. Um, public school, went to Stanford, he said, the scales fell from my eyes, and I realized what is possible in this country if you have wealth and access, things that he didn't have. Um, he ties very much into the Obama administration as well, arguing I am the heir to Obama, not Joe Biden. Joe Biden is too old. He likes to tell the story that he was getting pizza at Domino's when Obama called him and said, can you be my uh, HUD secretary? Um, very fascinating biography, um, clearly playing a progressive agenda, talks a lot about the need for early childhood education, um, background checks, um, path to citizenry on immigration, plays up a lot of um, appeal to the Latino vote, right? The question for him, and um, I didn't get a selfie with him because right after this he had to go do a CNN interview. And so he went into the house, and I just sort of stood and looked in the window and tried to wave to Anderson Cooper. Um, he was in the window there. Um, I think I have a slide of that. Do I have a slide? I do not. Um, question, is he too young? And of course, there's some, how many saw his debate performance in the third debate where he just really went after Joe Biden and said, Joe, you just said something, and now you're contradicting yourself two minutes later. You're too old, implicitly. Implying that, um, it turned out actually Biden hadn't contradicted himself, but never mind. Uh, not clear how that played out, um, whether it helped portray him as sort of somebody who was gathering center stage, who sort of had the maturity, the gravitas to run. But when you are in the second tier and you're on the debate stage, you can't play it safe. You've got to do something to get attention. And so he made uh, that choice. Amy Klobuchar, if you had asked me who's the one candidate who's best positioned to take the nomination for the Democratic Party, I would have said Amy Klobuchar, a woman. We know there's a gender gap. Women are disproportionately voting Democrat. From the Midwest, senator from Minnesota, experienced. She served several terms. Never lost an election, as she says repeatedly on the stump. 
um, has a great sense of humor. Uh, she said one of the most important things that I've heard on this trail, which is the way you beat Donald Trump is by not taking him seriously. Because what he does is he baits you into taking him seriously, and you don't. You don't take him seriously. You respond to him with humor. And she tells the story when she did her announcement um, of her presidential candidacy. She did it outside. A big snowstorm came up. Um, her hair was all messed up, and Donald Trump tweeted out something about, here she is talking about global climate change, global warming, and look, she's on a snowstorm. And he had some nickname for her. Um, what was the nickname? Snow woman or something like that. And he said, she tweeted out immediately, you know, Donald Trump, I'll tell you the difference between you and me. Your hair would have been a disaster in that weather. Uh, which was, you know, it was a pretty good response. So she's very good at humor. She tells some great stories. She says, I never lost a race. That goes all the way back to when I was in elementary school, running for elementary school president. My motto then was all the way with Amy Kay. And then she said, I used that as I got into the middle school, and people started looking at me. And I said, oh, OK. <laughs> We're dropping that slogan. <laughs> it took on new connotations. Um, but um, and of course, I have a soft spot because um, we stood in line, took the selfie. Um, her, one of her chief campaign aides is a former student of mine, so he gave me some extra time with her. And she immediately told me about all the political scientists she studied with at Yale. She was a political science major, so my heart melted. And I said, OK, you've got my vote, if I voted, which I don't. Um, so there's Amy, uh, but she's not gained any traction. Now, she staked a lot on doing well in Iowa. And uh, we'll see how that works out. Iowa, of course, her neighboring just south of her home state. She's moving up in the polls there, as she tells me every day repeatedly in the emails, um, and then asks for money. Um, but she's only at about 5% in Iowa. Um, so, you know, she really has got to do well there. She has qualified for the October debate, um, but she tends to get lost on the debate stage. And we might argue how much that is gender dynamics and how much of that is um, just her inability to break through. We'll talk a little bit about the gender dynamics going forward. If anybody knows her who's worked on Capitol Hill, there's a dark side to her. Um, and that's not necessarily come through in her public persona, but she goes through staff like a hot knife through butter. Um, supposed to be a hellion on wheels. You might have heard some of the stories. She's had staff shave her legs in the morning. Um, she kicked one staff member out on the highway. Uh, just stopped, said, get out. Left in there. He said, what about my, my cell phone, my cell phone? She hurled that out the window at him. Um, so she apparently, at least for assistants who work with her, she can be pretty abrasive. Again, my student has been working with her years and swears by her. So I don't know how much of that matters. Most, I think the most general public doesn't really know much about that. Um, but again, um, despite the appeal, she just hasn't gotten any traction. Um, and the new debate standard for November, you have to get 5% in polls. And she hasn't done that. You've got to do that in fourth. So she has one more chance on the debate stage, the October debate. And that may be it. She may be done if she can't get on the debate stage. Um, OK, who else have I seen here? Oh, real solutions, not impossible promises. Eh. John Delaney, a high tech guy, made a ton of money, served in Congress, decided it's his time to run for president. We saw him in New Hampshire at a. Uh, um, a senior home. Um, there were 25 people there. And uh, this was at the end of a long day for him. And uh, I tell you, this is when you really realize these candidates, I have so much admiration for what they do. He took uh, his staff kept saying, we got to move on. There's only 30 people here. But he took every question. And there was one persistent guy in the front who saw an opportunity to question a presidential candidate and would not let this guy go. Kept asking him questions. They got in a huge debate about the constitutionality of gun control. And Delaney stayed right there the whole time. Um, and uh, I felt so bad for him, I actually contributed to his campaign to try to get him on the debate stage, which he was in the first two debates, but not on the third debate. Um, Delaney is a very impressive guy, I got to tell you, um, as all of them. There he is, a well-known politician. Um, and his 
claim is, listen, let's not kid ourselves. You're going to run for president by a promise to take people's Medicare away? Or, I'm sorry, their private health insurance? That's going nowhere. All these progressive pie-in-the-sky ideals that appeal to you know, the 5% of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, you are dooming the Democrats in the general election. And having said that, when you listen to his issue stance, is this guy is a liberal, but a liberal by the standards of the Democratic Party 15, 20 years ago, a liberal by the standards of the Democratic Party four years ago. It just is a testament of how far the party has moved, at least among the activists in the debate, that his issues, for instance, he's for greater spending on pre-K. He wants gun control. He has a very interesting way to exercise gun control. He wants gun owners to have to be required to buy insurance. And he argues you turn insurance companies over into determining how much to charge you. And they're going to, if they think you're a high risk for owning a gun, they're going to charge you so much it'll price you out of the market. You won't be able to own a gun. See, there's a lot of really innovative ideas that are consistent with liberal values, and yet somehow he's being portrayed as a conservative in the Democratic Party. Um, I had a lot of admiration for him. This was the day before his 30th wedding anniversary, and I asked his staff whether he's going to go home with his wife. He said, nope, he's going out on the campaign trail on his anniversary, um, which I was very impressed with. My wife was not very impressed with that, but... <laughs> I think, do I have anybody else? So I'm midway through this, oops. So, um, and again, I assume someday in the next week to two weeks, you're probably gonna open up, unless Delaney wants to go in debt and self-fund, um, he will probably drop out because his money is drying up. Um, so I wouldn't put much on him. Okay. Pete Buttigieg. This guy is snuck up on us. Um, the guy you saw on the debate stage is the guy you see on the stump. He speaks in fully developed paragraphs. If I could lecture like him, I would just be happy. Uh, no uhs, no ahs, no stammering. Everything flows. Uh, he's the same way on the stump speech. Um, he has a way of reminding you of key aspects of his candidacy without hitting you over the head with it. So. He'll talk about foreign policy, and he'll just gradually let out and, you know, thinking about Afghanistan, and when I was there, these are the issues I saw. He reminds you that his military service. Same thing with his background as an openly gay politician. He doesn't hit you over the head with that, but it comes through when he talks about civil rights and the need to be inclusive and how this country is broadening its definition of what inclusivity means. And you know what he's talking about, but he's not hitting you over the head with it. Um, he's an interesting blend of pragmatic progressive policies. So for instance, on Medicare, he says, yeah, ultimately Bernie and Elizabeth is right. We want Medicare for all. That's where we should go. But it should be a choice. It shouldn't be foisted on you. So let's give that choice by creating a public option run by the government and then let the competition of ideas determine which one wins out. I'm confident in the long run, the government-sponsored health insurance is going to win out. But I am, as he said on the debate stage, I trust the American people to make that decision for themselves. So it's a very impressive um, presentation. He has by far the youngest staff that I saw. Young people really like this guy. Um, but he has some issues. Um, the most important one being, um, there he is, by the way, with a well-known politician. Um, we tried to, this is actually two different rallies. He was at that house in New Hampshire, the J.D. Salinger house. I asked the host, because it was a big crowd there, biggest one we had seen. He said it's the biggest crowd he's had at a rally since 1996 with Al Gore to the Buttigieg one. Now, I don't know what that means. It just might mean the J.D. Salinger crowd really likes him. It may say something about New Hampshire. I don't know if we want to read too much into it. But he has money, and he has great infrastructure organization on the ground. We'll see. He's staking a lot on Iowa and New Hampshire, a lot. And of course, that is part of his potential weakness. Can he expand his support to racial minorities? 
which are a huge part of the Democratic Party, right? 40% or more African American. Um, and his issues with race in South Bend may come back to haunt him. Um, we'll see how that plays out. Okay. <laughs> That is my sort of on the ground take of the candidates I've seen. Holy Toledo. Just the reminder, I showed you some polls. We're still very early on. If you wanna look at early polling, um, this was the actual nominee and how they were doing at about this time in previous years. And here's the leaders at this time. And you can see how many of these leaders actually got elected president. None of them. Um, Hillary Clinton at least won the nomination. So there's a lot of room for movement. Um, polling is very volatile this early, so we ought not to pay too much attention to it. On the other hand, it's the best indicator we have. Okay, what should we happen going ahead? Going ahead, this is where I'm gonna very briefly introduce you to political science. And the political science says this, that although we pay a lot of attention to what the voters preferences are expressed through polling and so on. The party is a very influential, by party now I mean the party leaders, the ones who hold formal positions, you know, the head of the DNC, the head of the DCCC, um, the Democratic Congressional Co uh, um, uh, Campaign Committee. Um, and how do they do this? How do they sort of manipulate things behind the scenes? In a variety of ways. This is the argument of the party decides. Um, and I'll very briefly show you evidence on each of these. One, uh, endorsements. Endorsements are a signal. Who's acceptable to the party? Basically, what the party wants is they want to select somebody who has the broadest support within their party, represents the party's principles, and still can win the general election. That's what the party is signaling through their endorsements. I believe this individual is best positioned to do this. Um, the second thing they do, can do, and this has become less useful to them, but when parties used to be able to contribute money, through soft money contributions, they would funnel money to the candidacies of the people they want. They can't do that anymore since some campaign finance reform, at least not directly. They can still do some indirectly. Third, they control the rules of the process. For instance, how do you get on the debate stage? Let's make rules that are designed to help the candidates we wanna see do well and hurt the ones that we don't do well. And we saw this in 2016 with um, Bernie Sanders complaining bitterly about when the de uh, debates were scheduled. They were all scheduled at times when no one was gonna watch them, he said. And that was designed to help Hillary Clinton. The party was in working behind the scenes. Okay, so let's look at some of these criteria. Uh, where are we on things like endorsements of, here's governors and members of Congress. Who have they endorsed? So far, Biden is running ahead. Kamala Harris has some strong support among California politicians. Um, Cory Booker. But if you think about, you know, between 535 members of Congress and then you've got your um, 50 governors, not a lot of people have committed so far in terms of endorsement. There's still a lot of room as they're sort of waiting to see who could do well here. Notice Bernie Sanders doing much better in the polls than he is with endorsements. Democrats aren't keen on having a socialist um, suddenly use their party as a vehicle to pursue his own interests when he doesn't work for the party in between the elections. Okay, um, money raised. Money is the mother's milk of politics, right? If you can raise money, you can stay in. And note, Bernie Sanders may not have the support of the party, but he's raised a ton of money in small bills. He has an active core of people who are contributing to him and will continue to do so throughout this process. And that means he's gonna be in it for the long haul. Pete Buttigieg is another one who's done very well raising money. Um, the people who are struggling, you know, the Cory Bookers, the John Delaney's, you can see in the red, they've already spent more than they've taken in. And the question is how much do they wanna go uh, into debt? Um, but money is important, but it's not necessarily controlled by the party. Um, and here's some other candidates raising. Of course, Jay Inslee is out. Uh, he's dropped out. Eric uh, Solwell is out. Kirsten Gillibrand is out. Um, and I expect to see um, Delaney dropping out too. Andrew Yang, an interesting character, part of the Yang gang. 
is the only candidate who can make explicitly ethnic-based jokes and get away with it. Um, you've heard all his Asian jokes, right? Um, the most recent one I heard was talking about the debate criteria to get on the stage. Um, he was asked, do you think the Democratic Party um, rig the debate stage with these debate criteria? And he said, listen, I'm Asian. I like tests. I do well on them. <laughs> really? You can say that? Apparently, he can say that with no repercussions. Um, OK. The other thing, of course, is you want to elect a candidate who is in the center of the Democratic Party, but also can win the general election. And what you're looking at is for ideological placement. So I'm just going to, this is based on candidates who have actually have a voting record in Congress. And this arrays them ideologically from the most liberal on this side to the most conservative on that side. And you can see, based on the voting record, and I won't go through the, the statistical algorithm we use here, but this accords with what you think, right? The more conservative candidates include Hickenlooper and Bullock and Klobuchar. By the way, just to give you a sense of where they are relative to the voting public, here are Democrats' ideology in South Carolina. South Carolina, relatively conservative in Nevada. In New Hampshire and in Iowa. So you can see where the candidates are relative to the center of the party in each of those states. And you can see the most liberal candidates, not surprisingly, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. Interestingly, John Delaney, by this measure of how you voted in Congress, is actually quite liberal. He's not coming across that way in terms of his issues. Now you notice there's some names not up here because they didn't have a voting record in Congress. So there's another way we try to get at their ideology. We look at the money that people give them, and then the other candidates those individuals support, and we figure they're giving money to the same similarly situated candidates ideologically. So this next slide includes that measure. And it's arrayed a little differently. This is the most conservative. This is the most liberal. And you can see Sanders and Warren and O'Rourke and Yang and Harris, all sort of on the liberal side of the party. In the middle, Klobuchar, Bennett, Buttigieg, and then sort of occupying the more centrist position, Biden, right? And of course, on the Republican side, there's Trump, there's Weld, and don't worry about uh, Mike Hogan. OK. So the question is, who will win the Democratic nomination this is sort of the distribution of the Democratic vote. You want to sort of be in the middle, but then still win, be able to move to the center and realistically capture most of the voters who are here. Okay, let me, let's see what should we should talk about here. Very quickly, one other influence on the nominating process is the media. And the media's criteria is different than the party. The party wants to nominate the candidate who has the strongest ideological sort of support within the party and can still win the election. The media's criteria is much more who makes for the most compelling narrative. And by that, they focus on personality. Um, they focus on differences among candidates rather than points of agreement. And to them, the nomination is all about a horse race. It's the tactics, who's ahead, who's behind, what are the measurements we can use to determine that. Um, and one of the most important impact the candidate, uh, the media has is they simplify. You read the opening paragraph after a debate, and the debate has 10 candidates. They can't possibly discuss all 10 candidates in the debate. So they're immediately picking winners and losers by who they talk about very early on. So the media exercises an independent influence on us by subtly cueing us into thinking who's ahead and who's behind in the horse race. And sometimes it's not so subtle. So for instance, if you look at the debate, ask yourself, who gets the most questions? Who gets the most debates time? The media determines that. And they have a specific criteria for doing that. Who's more newsworthy? And they are not going to give a lot of time to Marianne Williamson or Tulsi Gabbard because they're not viewed as legitimate candidates. They're on the fringe. And so it's a double-edged whammy. If you go on the debate stage and you're viewed as a fringe candidate, you're going to get off the debate stage viewed as a fringe candidate, because the media is going to focus on those people in the center. How do I know that? Because we actually measure these things. 
right? Um, or some people measure them. So think about the most recent debate. Who got the most debate time? Hmm, interesting. Biden, Warren, Sanders, Harris, Buttigieg. Those are the top five candidates in the polling. Coincidence? I think not. Now, how did uh, Booker get in there? Because he just cut off the moderator and jumped in to try to make himself heard, right? Um, which is what you've got to do if you're not going to get called on. And in any particular case, there was a, a dynamic on race that he was, uh, he was piggybacking in on a little bit on that. Um, who doesn't get the, as much time? The second tier candidates. And of course, Andrew Yang, way down there at seven minutes. Um, OK. Major sources of division that are going to determine how this turns out. Uh, one, generational. Has the torch been passed? We always hear this talk about younger candidates versus the older candidates. One of the problems here is if I ask my students, would you vote for somebody who's 75 years old or would be 75? They say, no, I really wouldn't. But of course, then I ask, are you going to vote? Well, I'm not registered yet. OK, so there's. <laughs> You got to actually show up, and you folks show up, right? And you folks think, 75, that's not that old, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> right? That's our prime, actually, when no one will consider it. So we'll have to see who shows up. But there is this generational divide. Ideology, I've talked enough about that. How far left can you go to win the nomination and then make a credible run in the general election? Race. Some candidates are doing very well across racial lines. Some so far have not demonstrated an ability to do that. Looking ahead, these are all things we have to see how they play out. It's too early to make judgments on this. And then, of course, geography, right? Um, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that if I have time at the end in the question and answer. OK. Um, this, of course, by the way, just to give you a sense of the age of the candidates compared to presidents who were actually elected on their, uh, and how old they were on election day. Um, so, you know, but today 70 is the new 50. So we live a lot longer. So they may look older, but you know, they're not that old. Wow. But you can see the difference. OK. In the last four nominees, we're able to place them on a similar ideological scale. And this gives you a sense of how the party has moved to the left. So again, 100 is moderate. Zero is liberal. Kerry and Obama were 66. Clinton, 63. The average ideology of the 2020 uh, Democrats is 51. So the candidate pool is shifted left. And it'll be a question to see whether that, how that plays out. OK. Let me just sum up with a very state of the race. I have tons of other stuff we can talk about and I can show you, but I'm cognizant that we're going to have gone an hour here and I want to, I hope you guys have some questions to ask. If not, I'll subject you to more slides. Where do I think things are today? Keeping in mind, this is, there's nothing really scientific about this. This is based on my read of what I'm seeing in the survey data, talking to voters, what I'm seeing at rallies, but it, there's no level of precision here. We are in a state of flux. Things are changing. I, two of you just told me, did you see what happened in the news today? And I said, no, I taught all day. And then I got in a car and drove down here. So is President Trump still president? <laughs> Barely, apparently. Some, something's happening. So things are changing on an almost hourly basis here. Having said that, I think this sort of holds up. Biden, to me, is the Hillary Clinton of 2016 with a different type of baggage, but clear baggage. One is he has a voting record. He's got to defend that voting record. A lot of the issues that made him a liberal back in the 70s are now viewed as, as Kamala Harris pointed out, on areas like busing. They're now viewed as even conservative, if not moderate view. So is that a liability? He has strong support among African Americans, but there's a real generational divide there. My African American students, of which there aren't very many at Middlebury, um, will tell you they go back to the churches in the South and the older generation swear by Joe Biden. But the younger blacks, not so much. So again, there's a turnout issue here. In fact, one of the biggest questions we have here is turnout. Who's actually going to show up and vote? Uh, Warren, she 
unlike Sanders, the great advantage I think Elizabeth Warren has is she is a progressive, but she does not have the strident voice. She does not situate her progressiveness-ism in the sense of the system itself needs to be revamped. She says the system is OK. It's the people in it who have been bought off by, so we need to elect better people. And yeah, we got to modify the system, but I'm not trying to tear it down, unlike Bernie. So she, there's, a, there's a practical side to her, her progressivism um, that I think has helped her so far. And partly Bernie, frankly, he's suffering from fatigue. Um, this is the second time around. We're sort of what was new in 2016 now seems kind of tiresome. Yeah, the first time I heard you, the crazy uncle at the picnic, yeah, you said some interesting things. Now, for God's sakes, will you just shut up already, right? <laughs> There's that sort of reaction among some people to Bernie Sanders. But he has core supporters who would live and die by his candidacy, and they're not going anywhere, and he is a prodigious fundraiser. And he has um, an infrastructure, um, a nationwide infrastructure. So he's probably going to be in this for a while, I just don't see him expanding his coalition. He just has shown no evidence at all, unlike Warren, who continues to incrementally add support as other candidates drop out. None of the candidates who have dropped out has their support gone to Bernie Sanders. He's sort of, sort of stuck there. That's the top tier right now. But that's very much a tier in which the support, to me, does not seem necessarily solid, particularly for Biden. Um, sort of right below them, Harris. I think Harris peaked very early on paper. There's a lot to like about. She comes from California, which has moved its primary up to March 3rd, Super Tuesday. Um, she's raised a lot of money. She checks a lot of boxes demographically. She can speak to racial minorities. But you know what? Racial minorities don't actually trust her because of her record as an attorney general. There's a lot of sense among African Americans that she was, her prosecutorial record was too aggressive. And she's now trying to back off that and explain that, but she has not built up a lot of credibility among the African-American community yet. Um, and on paper, at least, that strengths have not translated to actual polling support. She's actually been losing support recently. Buttigieg, on the other hand, um, has come out of nowhere, um, has developed a strong reputation on the issues. He's stolen some of O'Rourke's thunder as sort of this um, candidate of the young. The question is whether he can enlarge that in racial minorities as well. And we just don't know. Um, it's really hard to tell until we actually have voting. But I would put them in the second tier. And then there's the people who really their candidacy depends on getting on the debate stage. And then parlaying that into doing well in those first two contests in Iowa and New Hampshire. Because Iowa and New Hampshire is not going to knock off the top tier. They have the resources to stay in the race. What it does is it winnows the field. It knocks off the people on the bottom. If they do not show a spark, they cannot raise money. If they cannot raise money, they cannot continue to campaign. Um, and so you see these candidates sort of boxing, them, boxing each other around, um, picking their moments when they can try to create that viral moment that Harris temporarily did off the first debate. Um, I'm not going to sort of take you through each of these. Each of them have some unorthodox aspects that they're trying to parlay uh, into their candidacy. Um, it's not clear to me that any of this is translated into momentum, at, the, at least at this stage. OK. I'm going to end here is just to keep you an idea of going ahead. So we have the first four contests that we have polling data for. Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina. By the way, what I have here is the breakdown in 2016 of the vote uh, of the Democratic electorate, male, female, white, black, Hispanic. So those first two contests, predominantly white. Then we move to Nevada, which has a strong Hispanic population. Then South Carolina, two-thirds African-American, again, in the And this is going to give us our first indication of how individuals like Sanders, Buttigieg, 
um, even Warren, do well among African Americans. Then Super Tuesday, look at this. I think after Super Tuesday, we're gonna emerge with probably two, possibly three candidates. There'll be a progressive candidate, there'll be the moderate candidate, there may be someone hanging on in either one of those categories. But everyone else I think will be pretty well done by March 3rd. I will be in Iowa, and then I'm heading to New Hampshire, then I will be in South Carolina. I gotta pick a state here. Uh, I'm gonna pick the warmest state I can find <laughs> in March. I hope you follow me on the blog, and we'll talk about that. Um, but notice a couple of things. A lot of racial minorities in the southern states like Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia. If you can't attract support among racial minorities, it's gonna become pretty clear by Super Tuesday. Um, the other thing to point out, caucuses versus primaries. If you think about the states that went for Obama in 2012 that Bernie picked up, these are them. And you notice those C's? Most of those are caucus states. Bernie did very well among caucus states. Caucus states tend to attract the more ideologically active part of the electorate because it requires you to spend all day sort of caucusing. Um, and they tend to be less diverse racially. Hillary Clinton, the ones that Obama won in 2012 that she picked up, almost all pri uh, primary states and much more diverse in terms of black and white. Remember these caucus states, usually the population is so small, the turnout is so small, you don't even have racial minorities. Um, I expect to see that break down again um, in, in uh, the primaries going ahead. Okay, I'm just gonna stop there. Um, I have a, a, a few slides that look at the importance of the Democratic Party's base. It is increasingly where the election is gonna be fought in 2020 is in the suburbs. Urban areas have gone predominantly overwhelmingly Democratic. Rural areas have moved predominantly uh, Republican. It's the suburbs. We saw this in 2018. Where did the Democrats pick up their seats? Purple suburbs. Suburbs that have a, a, a mix of uh, Republicans and conservatives. How did they pick that up? By running on agenda that said, I am gonna protect your health care. I am gonna protect the benefits that you have. Um, that's where this election is gonna play out, in the suburbs. Um, and I can show you some really interesting slides um, about how the Democratic Party's base of support has increasingly shifted to the metropolitan suburbs. And the Republicans has moved to the suburbs that are more rural. And it's sort of that intersection of those two areas in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, that are gonna determine whether Donald Trump, who will be the nominee, unless I miss something today, um, whether Trump comes back for another four years or whether a Democrat can defeat him. So when you're thinking about who, vote, who to vote for, ask yourself who's going to win those suburbs in those key states in the general election. All right, I've got tons more slides, but let's open it up for questions, and I can try to work those in there. Yes, up front. Um, I've been surprised at how many people I know, friends of ours, who, who say a woman can't be elected, and it just, it blows my mind because I, th I thought we were beyond that. And the fact that we didn't elect a woman um, last time, I don't think necessarily <laughs> has anything to do with this election. The other thing that is that you mentioned uh, kids in your classes yeah. are, are not registered to vote. And th that disturbs me. I mean, is, is that a trend or? Uh, so did everyone hear those good questions? Uh, question one about, um, in fact, I just had one of my former students who's worked the last seven years for Sheldon Whitehouse on the Senate uh, come give a talk about women in politics and address that issue. Really fascinating. I talked about the gender dynamics on the Hill and what it's like to be a woman um, in, a, in an area in, in which staff at the senior level is predominantly male. 
and um, some of the dynamics involved there. Um, the question you ask is something we've studied as political scientists. Is gender a handicap for women in running for office? And it is, so the first thing you have to know is when we talk about it, we typically talk about running for Congress because there simply have not been enough cases of women running for the presidency. So we're kind of limited on here, and we might make the argument that the evidence of whether women do well from Congress doesn't extrapolate to the presidency because the presidency is a different type of issue. And we look at that in a more male-oriented term, executive, war powers, whereas Congress is a more nurturing institution, right? Having said that, here's what we know about women. When women run for office, for Congress, they do as well as men. There is no evidence that they are handicapped. The question is, do they run for office as frequently as men? And they do not. And there are a couple of reasons for this. But one of the most important is they're not asked. Women have to be asked multiple times to run for office. You ask a man, well, I need you to run for office. He says, I'm in. Women got to be asked. And they are not asked as frequently. So where we see gender coming in is the disparity in women and men who run for office. Once they run, women do as well as men. Why does it matter? Because once they're in office, women generally pursue a different agenda in Congress. It is not an agenda, by the way, that is focused on, quote unquote, women's issues, abortion, um, things like that. It's focused more on where women differ dramatically from men. And there is a distinct gender gap, by the way, um, which my student talked about today, which is really problematic for Republicans. They simply don't have enough women representing Republican issues. But where men and women differ in the issues they represent in Congress is women are much more focused on spending money on the most vulnerable parts of society. So they're much more likely to focus on early childhood education, spending money, than are men. And you see that uh, in the comp So for instance, my, my student was a senior staffer, the senior health aide to Sheldon Whitehouse. And when she went to um, caucus meetings on the Hill to talk about health care, they were all women. They were dominated by women legislators and women staffers. And when she poked her head in foreign policy, predominantly men. So it matters whether we elect a woman or a man, potentially, but we simply don't know whether those dynamics that I've talked about play out in the presidential election. To this day, women of your age believe Hillary Clinton was discriminated against behind, because of her gender. Younger students say, no. I had a lot of women who had no interest in voting for Hillary Clinton, just thought she was a horrible candidate, had credibility issues and everything. And they, I said, don't you want to see the glass ceiling broken? And they said, um, which glass ceiling are you talking about? We never had a woman president. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's not important. We'll have one. So you know, it is a real interesting gender dynamic that's also generational. The women who have come of age under Title IX and their, their sports teams and everything, it's less important for them to elect a woman for the sake of electing a woman, and much more important that they elect the woman that represents their issues. So that's a long way of saying we don't know if a woman was handicapped running for president. My instinct is no. You get the right woman. And gender's not going to hurt them. But it's more speculative than I'd like um, based on that. The second question, younger people don't vote nearly as much at the rate that older people do. And one of the reasons is they're not in the system. My students are attending college at Middlebury. They may be residents of a different town. They got to get absentee ballots. Or they have to register. Thank God now Vermont has same day registration. So they can just go down to Middlebury uh, and register. But you have to tell them to do that. So it's not really a lack of interest. It's just they have not been socialized into the process of voting. So what's the lowest voting co age cohort? It's the 18 to 24 year olds. And a lot of that is simply because they're not registered. They're, they don't think about the need to register. Whereas you guys are in the habit of it. You've established residency. Um, you're registered to vote. Um, it's part of your civic duty. You've got nothing else to do with your lives, <laughs> right? So you vote. So I didn't mean to castigate my students. It's not a lack of enthusiasm. They're out there. Every one of my students, what's interesting, uh, every one of them, many of them are out there working for campaign candidates right now. And it's a, been a wonderful resource for me because they email me about what's going on on these races. 
Hi. Um, a quick comment sure. on, you know, there's a lot of talk about can a, can a woman win? Yes. Hillary won the popular vote. She did win the popular vote. And I predicted that, remember? <laughs> <laughs> and as for myself, I have voted for a woman and will, and I'm going to vote whoever the Democratic Party is. But one thing that worries me is that, as an example, what was it, three or four months ago, it was big news that Nora O'Donnell was made the news anchor at one of the stations, and that was news. So I worry about a yep. lot of other people. Anyway, these, um, purple, you call them purple suburbs? Yeah, the purple suburbs. What Do we have any data on the education levels on those areas? Because um, I'm thinking like, Sanders does well with non-college educated whites. Warren is does well with educated whites. Um, you know, and I'm just hoping that we elect and we get we nominate someone who's going to appeal to a, a bunch of different constituencies. Thank you. So here's the white vote by education level and residents. And what you see, again, this is only two elections, 2012 to 2016, but you can see white college vote. So what we're looking at here, just to situate you, is the left-hand side is the share of the vote in the general election received by Democrats. This is in the presidential vote, and we're looking at white voters. Um, white college vote is moving Democratic. White college vote in the top metropolitan areas, suburbs surrounding the top areas, is moving even faster. Whereas white non-college in those areas is trending Republican, and white non-college outside those sort of metropolitan suburbs is even more Republican. So yeah, these, sta these areas tend to be highly educated generally, but again, as you move away from the metropolitan area, more into the rural ones, education levels tend to drop. And that's why, you know, it's really, this is where we're gonna fight that election. That's a great question. Why? Because it allowed me to show another slide. I may be um, revealing personal bias, but I, I would like you to comment on the durability of the crazy things our president gets away with. What one would think if he won a very narrow election last time, all he's got to do is shoot himself in the foot once or twice. He does it every single week. Why is that and how can he get away with it? So uh, this is a question I hear often. Um, and what I will tell you is what Trump supporters tell me. Because you go and you go to these rallies, and I, I asked them early on, I said, you know, this guy says outrageous things out there. Doesn't that bother you? And they would say, no. He's doing it to piss Democrats off. I mean, he, you go to, to, you know, you give your talks, and what do they ask you? They ask you, how does this guy get away with this? I love it, right? So. He uh, is catering to a particular segment of the population that said, finally, we got some guy who doesn't politically correct, who tells the truth in the sense that he's candid. The things that these other politicians wouldn't say. And I say, but you know, a lot of the stuff factually, it was a very interesting phenomenon in 2016. Um, they would say, you know, we know He's trolling us. We know he's trolling the media, and these things are uh, designed to outrage. Um, and there is a very uh, perceptive analysis of Trump voters um, by a woman named um, Selena Zito, who was writing, and she actually wrote a, bo a book about the election, and she said the difference between the media and Trump supporters is the media takes Trump literally, but not seriously. His supporters take him seriously, but not literally. And at his rallies, he would mock the reporters in the back. And of course, the reporters, are because they didn't pass security, they'd be hemmed up in the back, and they couldn't actually go out and talk to the people. And the, 
people would cheer and laugh and say, but what it was for them in the contrast to the way the media reported this, because I would go back home and I would watch the media and they would somberly say, Donald Trump in his speech today um, said 14 factual errors and um, they were very serious about this and everything. But if you were at the rally, it was like you were at a giant pep rally. It was like a rock concert. And you know, he, would, he, would, he had his pet lines. He would say, and you know, we're gonna build a wall. And he would hesitate. And the crowd would all look at each other and say, okay, and who's gonna pay for the wall? And everyone would go, Mexico! And they'd all scream and high five each other and everything. It was a rally, it was a pep rally. But the media wasn't reporting that, that way. And you, know, you have to understand that. You're looking here and you're, uh, you're appalled by this guy's the president of the United States and he's saying these things and how does he get away with it? If you went to a Trump rally, they would say, about time we got a president who's sticking it to the media. Who don't, and remember, you know, the media for them is the Washington Post and the New York Times. It's the Amtrak Quarter. Who's their audience? New York, Washington. It's not the suburbs where these white voters who didn't go to college are occupied. That's who Trump is talking to, right? The question is, as you, several of you pointed out, is that going to be enough to get him to win re-election? And you know, it was enough in 2016, and the question is, can he recreate that sort of drawing a straight flush? Um, because a lot of things had to fall into place, among them Hillary Clinton playing into sort of the, the idea of an elitist Democrat by calling all Trump supporters deplorables, for instance. Um, so I'm not defending him here, but I'm trying to give you a sense of how a Trump supporter responds to it. And it's, it's very different than the way that many of us in Vermont would respond to him. I'm a little amazed that four states, two of which are totally unlikely to produce electoral votes for a Democrat, and two others that are at best maybe swing states, uh, have an enormous effect on the momentum of nominations. Uh, but having said that, what's the possibility that enough people hang in long enough to split the primary votes into enough cases so we can go back to the good old days of smoke filled runs yes. and, and bargaining, because I really miss that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was at the 2016 Republican convention. I got blogger credentials to go there. And you might remember heading into it, there was a lot of intrigue about whether Ted Cruz was going to you know, stampede the convention and he was going to refuse to endorse Trump and whether there'd be you know, a brokered convention and the media would just, and it went nowhere. And it hasn't happened, really, that the convention has been a deciding mechanism since the early 1950s. So I'm skeptical that it's going to happen this time. But this is the great weakness of political scientists and my weakness, which is I tend to think things are going to happen in the future the way they happened in the past. Um, and I'm usually right until they don't. And <laughs> right? So yeah, it is possible with 20 candidates if enough See, and I can take you through that sequence and play out a scenario where nobody gets a majority of the delegates. And then you go into the convention and guess what? They've gotten rid of the superdelegates, at least on the first ballot, but then the superdelegates jump in again on the second and the rules matter and you could, you know, all bets are off. The party does not want that to happen. The Democratic Party wants to settle on a, a, a candidate very early and historically that happens. Um, so I can't give you the odds um, and I can't guarantee you this is not going to have a brokered convention. I think it's highly unlikely. Uh, I think, um, and you're absolutely right, the first two states are lily white states. And that's why Nevada and South Carolina were moved up by the Democratic Party in order to ensure that there was a more racially diverse electorate winnowing the field very early. But coming out of Super Tuesday, I'm more confident that we're not going to have eight candidates. Um, instead, we're going to have like three. And then the normal winnowing process, I think, will just go on. Um, now, who those candidates are, I don't know. Having said that, you, Gloria just uh, revels in having me say things like this, and then she invites me back after they turn out to be completely wrong, <laughs> and makes me stand up in front of the crowd and explain once again that I was wrong. I, I want to go back to this chart and the notion of purple states and purple suburbs within those states. Yeah. Uh, 
you, you can stand here and say that's where the election in November of 2020 is going to be won or lost, and I think most people would agree with that statement. I would think that the leaders of the Democratic Party would understand that as well. What I find baffling in the process is if that's the case, why isn't the party focusing on identifying and promoting a candidate that can win where the election needs to be won, as opposed to the process that the party, by definition, because it's happening, has endorsed? Yeah. Why, why does it happen the way it's happening when you know what the election is going to be about? And it's not what they're talking about now. <laughs> Great question. And this is some of the candidates on the stump are making exactly your argument. Let's not be short-sighted here. Let's not you know, have a food fight on a set of issues that no matter who is selected to run on those issues is going nowhere in the general election. You're just feeding into the Republicans. Um, but you have to remember among the Democrats, you know, this isn't just, these are a lot of the people who are active in the nominating stage, particularly in caucuses, these are party purists. They believe in Medicare for all. They think it is time that we join the rest of the modern world and embrace Medicare. I mean, Bernie Sanders has been articulating this mantra since he was a socialist mayor of Burlington. Well, he's actually gotten a little more progressive since then. Um, and now he's his opportunity. Um, you know, the, the thing about Bernie is his message is authentic. Right? He's not going to change his message. The people who believe in him believe in him because of that message. And they want to see that implemented because they think that's best for the country. And you know, you may say, well, it's not practical. But their viewpoint is, it may not be practical, but it's right. It's, that's what the difference is between professional politicians. When you go back to the smoke-filled room, they said, what candidate can get elected? to this more open process that's dominated by activists who, they're the ones who are, you know, you talk about the influence of money on presidential elections, it's not the corporations. It's the ideologues, the purists. And if you do not abide by what they want, they will primary you. One of the things we've seen is Congress has become more polarized. Why has it become more polarized? Because candidates who are moderate, the Richard Lugers, um, among the Republican Party, um, you know, or the Jim Jeffords, uh, to speak of a moderate Vermonter, they get primaried. And then in the general election, you're faced with two relatively extreme candidates. And, you know, the Democrats are cameling. We might uh, elect somebody who is progressive, but that's where we should be going as a country. And we can make the argument in a general election that, okay, these policy issues might seem a stretch for you, but it's the future. And the future is now, and we're betting you're gonna choose that as opposed to another four years of Donald Trump. Whereas the more pragmatic politicians say, no, nah, you're ignoring the reality and issues like Medicare where nobody in their right mind is gonna support a candidate who's promising to take away your health care. I mean, that's part of what's interesting for me going out there and seeing there's a stark choice that Democrats are facing right now and which direction they're gonna go. And for everyone who argues your side, there's somebody else who says, no, Bernie's right. This is where we wanna be as a nation, right? Healthcare is a right. Everybody should have it. And who better than the government to ensure that that happens? Um, along those lines, uh, what happened in the last um, presidential election was that Bernie's supporters decided that he had been robbed and they all stayed home except for a few who actually came out to vote for Trump. Given the or a third party candidates. ideological um, split that is in fact happening in the Democratic Party right now, how concerned are you that that might happen again? Because I'm very concerned. Yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, to this day, the hardcore Clinton supporters will not forgive Bernie supporters because um, they argue they simply didn't turn out in the numbers. Now, you know, we can debate how true that is. Um, but it is true that some Bernie Sanders supporters went third party. Some didn't vote. Some went for um, Donald Trump. So the vast majority of them actually voted for Hillary Clinton, but maybe not in the numbers. And that's saying, again, remember, when you think about our popular vote and people who unfortunately enough saw my previous talk on 
that she did about as well as we expected in the popular vote. So there wasn't a huge drop off. It's just that the location of it was not efficiently distributed. So how worried am I that you know, Bernie or Elizabeth, their supporters are not gonna go to the nominee if the nominee is more moderate? You know, I, I suspect there'll be some defection. I, in a close race, you can point to almost anything as the deciding factor, but that wouldn't be my biggest worry. Um, you know, I don't, I, if I'm um, a Joe Biden supporter, um, there's a lot more things that I can control that I'd worry about than the fact that maybe Bernie's, the Sandinistas, are not gonna support me in the general election. Quick question about um, the role of rallies. Um, yeah. Michael Barbero on The Daily did a really interesting piece on, um, on the anatomy of Elizabeth Warren's um, rally in New York this week. And I was totally fascinated by that. And then you brought up, you know, that rallies is something that you're looking at. So I was wondering, you know, if you would comment on, on, you know, how you see rallies as an important leading indicator of anything. Um, and then the other quick question is just about um, sort of the, the diversity of media. So getting, you know, getting political news from podcasts is very different from getting it from CNN and, you know, how that might influence depending on what your diet of, of media is. So let me take the second question first, the diet of media. Keep in mind, cable news is, um, you know, it's less than 1%, uh, the audience is less than 1% of registered voters in the nation as a whole. So do not, when you think about what cable news is talking about, do not take that as a reflection of the issues that Joe and Jane Sixpack are thinking about. They tend to think a lot more about bread and butter issues about, you know, crime, jobs, um, things like that. Um, but I do think it's important for you as consumers, many of you are here because you're politically informed and interested. You know, I, I love the New York Times, but they just blew the Russian collusion story. They just blew it. Um, and I was a journalist before I went into political science. I would have been fired um, if I covered that story the way they did, relying on anonymous sources and continually just botching the story. And in the end, there was no there there in terms of the collusion. Now, the obstruction of justice is another issue, and um, I'm not denying the validity of that. But, you know, the problem is the national news media is fighting a losing war for audience. They are fracturing. Uh, my students, most of them, um, yeah, they will look at an online news source, but usually it's in the form of a digest. And then they might, on Facebook, um, talk about a lot of the issues on social media. It's entirely different than your generation when you sat down with the newspaper and the sort of the traditional news have been losing the audience right and left. And I don't know how many read the memoirs here by Jill Abramson, uh, the New York Times managing editor, but she said she saw the, the impact of that in the newsroom. They become increasingly concerned with the demographics of their audience and running stories that were gonna generate enough revenue to keep them afloat. Now, Donald Trump has been a godsend for them. They are not losing money now. They're doing it hand over fist. But the question is at what cost in terms of journalistic integrity, right? At what cost do you become a cheerleader? Do you become the Fox News of the left, right? So I would encourage you to diversify your sources, not to change your perspective, but to understand what a lot of people out there who look at Donald Trump and don't necessarily gag the way a lot of you do, understand why that is, what Trump's appeal is. And if you dismiss it as simply, well, there's a bunch of racial bigots out there, you're missing a big part of his story. I mean, I'm not denying there's some racial bigotry, um, but there's a lot more than that. So it's very important that you diversify your media as much as you can and be alert to the limits of the types of stories that they're pushing and why they're pushing them. That's not to say the New York Times, you shouldn't, you shouldn't read it. I mean, they still are when they put their mind to it one of the best journalistic um, institutions we have. Um, I'm sorry, I've, now I've lost the train of thought on the other question. About, about the rallies. So for me, the rallies was back to ground zero. I had become so focused on data, large data analysis and, and models and mathematical algorithms that I forgot the important thing, which is the message that the candidates are articulating and how it's being received. Because when Trump was running, his message was being 
encapsulated in these snippets in the newspaper, I was saying, how is this guy getting any support? I mean, it's Mexican rapists, and it's Joe Biden, uh, 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 John McCain is, uh, where, why is he getting any support? And the media is talking about um, Joe the plumber is a bigot and everything. Are they all bigots? Uh, well, some people say, yes, they are, <laughs> okay. Uh, and I had to go to the rally. So what the rallies do to me is, candidates have to make a conscious choice in a limited amount of time to say, this is what the election is about. And this is why, given that, I am the candidate of choice. You can't get that anywhere else. You can't get that through the filter of a cable news excerpt. You can't get that, really, even, you can't get a flavor watching the rallies on television. Um, so rallies are just crucial. And I, I encourage you to go to them. You are next door to one of the really touchstone states. And thank God for that. Um, so you know, go to some of these. But we'll have some candidates come to Vermont. Um, not very many. Um, to, but the other thing is, then listen to how people react to what the candidate is saying and talk to them. Say, hey, what'd you think of that? I remember talking to somebody about Trump's language. The guy was 75 years old, and, uh, and I said to him, you know, um, what do you think about his language? He said, did you ever do business in New York? I said, no. He said, that's how everybody talks in New York. That's, <laughs> that's how you get job, the job done. OK, I never would have known that, right? I remember talking to a woman, and I said, you know, this guy makes these comments to me that seem really misogynistic. I mean, and he, she said, um, yeah, I wish you wouldn't say that, but I'm looking past that to the things that are important to me or to what he's talking about. Uh, and she said, I'm going to vote for him. Um, so I wouldn't have got that if I didn't go to the rallies, right? So, you know, I think that's a great way to end. I appreciate you coming to this particular mini encapsulation of my rally. And um, I hope Gloria invites me back. Um, and we can see how well some of these mini predictions turned out. So thank you very much.